This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is May 2nd, and you are worshiping with New Providence Presbyterian Church in Maryville, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us today. Since we're all connecting from home, I hope you'll use the comments section here on Facebook to greet one another. Last week, I asked folks to drop a word into that section to describe how their week had been. I want to ask you to do that again today. My word would be heartful. I'm not sure that's a word, but since I used it, I guess it is now. Tell us how you would describe your week. I hope that's just one more way for us to stay in touch with one another beyond just good morning. There's a link there in the comments section that will take you to the bulletin, and that includes a calendar of all the events for the week ahead. Later in the service, you'll see another link there that will allow you to make an online donation if you would like. As we near the end of our fiscal year, we are so grateful for all of those gifts. Of course, if you'd prefer, you're always welcome to mail a check to the church office. Thank you all for your faithful generosity. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Let us join together in our call to worship. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. Let us worship the God who is love and follow Jesus Christ, our risen Lord.
Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess to God and to one another our failure to love our neighbor. Loving God, we have not loved you as we ought. We have held on to love as if it were to be hoarded rather than shared freely. We have set limits on something that ought not have borders. We have guarded how we have loved others instead of sharing your grace. Forgive us for not loving as you have loved us, without condition. Forgive us when we deem some, but not others, worthy of our love or yours. Forgive us for not following the example of Jesus, who laid down his life for us all. Call us to your way so that your image is reflected in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, who came to us in the name of love, we pray. Friends, you have already been cleansed by the word that God has spoken to you. In baptism, God claimed you and joined you to Christ. Believe the promise given to you. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Good morning, sweet friends. Happy Sunday. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm so happy to be here with you this morning. And I also hope that you have been spending some time outside this weekend or in the last few days enjoying the beautiful weather we've been having. Speaking of outside, I want to talk with you this morning about something that grows outside. I want to talk with you about grapes. Now you might be thinking, Miss Haley, what do grapes have to do with church and what I know and believe about God? And it does sound funny, but the truth is, it has a lot to do with what we know and believe about God. I want you to picture grapes in your head. And I want you to either think or say out loud something you know about grapes. You might be thinking, I know that grapes are green or purple, and I know that grapes are a roundish shape. You might be saying, I know that grapes are a fruit. Grapes have seeds. You might be thinking, I know grapes can be dried and turned into raisins. All of those things are true. Now, I want you to think a little harder, dig a little deeper, and think about this. How do grapes grow? Do grapes grow on a tree like apples you pick? They don't. Do grapes grow under a layer of dirt like a potato you have to dig up or like a carrot you have to pull? They don't. So how do grapes grow? Some of you may know the answer, and you may be saying to me right now, grapes grow on a vine. And you're right, grapes do grow on a vine. I think of a vine as like a thick string or a rope that kind of twists and curls. The vine is very important to growing grapes. The vine is a source of life. The vine keeps things stable. It supports the grapes. It helps transport food and water and the important things the grapes need to grow. When you have a grapevine, you have the vine, and growing out of the vine, you have these little bitty like twigs that are called branches. 
Think about when you eat grapes and you pick them straight out of the carton or the bag you bought them in. When you pick them off, there's these little twigs left behind. Those are the branches. And then of course, at the end of the branches are the grapes. So the vine, the branches, and the fruit. Now, I want you to think about when you see grapes in the grocery store. Do you ever just see just one grape for sale? No, they're called a bunch of grapes. There are a bunch of them. I want you to think about those branches. Is it one straight branch, one grape, one straight branch, one grape, or do the branches go all over the place with all the grapes touching and sitting on top of each other? It's the second one. All of the grapes grow from different branches that are all connected to each other and those branches were all once connected to one vine. And that's where God comes into this. In the scripture Miss Emily is going to read to us today, Jesus tells us, I am the vine and you are the branches. Jesus is the vine, our source of life. And we, as followers of Christ, are the branches that grow from him. Now, from those branches, what grows? Fruit. You might be thinking, Miss Haley, I don't grow fruit. But I bet you know that's not what Jesus meant. When Jesus talks about those branches and vines bearing fruit, Jesus means the fruit that we put out into the world, the love that we share, the grace, the forgiveness, the helpful heart that we share with others. That's our fruit. Just like those grapes are connected to the branches and the branches are connected to the vine, we are connected to God. And we are also connected to each other, like those branches sticking out all over the place. And that's the point. We are all children of God. And as followers of Christ, God calls us to remember that just like we are connected to him, we are connected to each other. And the more connected to God and each other we are, the more fruit we can bear, the more love we can share, the more forgiveness we can offer. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And when we are in him, he is in us and we bear fruit that is great to share with the world. Our love, our grace, and our forgiveness. What a wonderful fruit to grow. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you that you are the vine that anchors us, keeps us stable, and gives us life. We thank you that we grow from you and that we are connected to one another working together to bear the fruit of your love into the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you guys. Bye, sweet friends. The gospel reading this morning comes from the 15th chapter of John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower who removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, the vine grower prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. And then on to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. 
Lord of the one true vine, in you we live and move and have our being. We are your branches, sometimes spindly and fragile. So now would you nourish us by your word so that our lives may bear fruit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, I ran across a newspaper article written by a volunteer with the Boston Animal Rescue League. She describes herself as a matchmaker, helping humans fall in love with animals who need to be rescued. She tells the story of one such adoption. A young, outdoorsy-looking couple came in asking to meet Sierra, whom they had seen online. No one ever asked to see Sierra, the writer says. She was a mutt with skinny legs that went this way and that. She was cute, but regularly pooped in her kennel and then ran back and forth in it. She thought it was fun to grab your, her, your arm with her mouth hard. She zoomed around as if she were on amphetamines. This was her big chance. I didn't want to mislead the couple, she said, but I did want to find her a home. When we got to a meeting room, I started reading the notes out loud and dropped Sierra's leash, hoping for the best. She began ricocheting around the room, bouncing off the couch and the bookcases and the man's legs. She was a blur of black, mouth wide open, joy in her eyes. On one pass, she ripped my clipboard out of my hand and kept running. As I muffled a sigh, the writer says, the couple laughed hard. I looked up, their faces were glowing. I love her, the man said. Me too, said the woman. We want her. The writer goes on to say, everyone knows that dogs can be fire hose like gushers of unqualified love. But humans, she says, have always struck me more as takers than givers. Fickle lovers who are cagey with their affections and their hearts. But in watching people tumble for goofballs like Sierra, I began to see how humans long to give their hearts away. Listen to that again. I began to see how humans long to give their hearts away. In the words we use for our call to worship this morning, the Apostle John suggests that is hardwired into us. Beloved, he calls us, not once but twice. Beloved, because God so loves us. Beloved, John says, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now, earlier in 1 John, the writer introduced two big theological concepts. Love, how those of us who have experienced Christ's love can express that to others, and knowledge, what it means to know God and to know the spirit of truth. And in these, this passage, those themes come together. Love entails knowing God, and knowing God is demonstrated by active love for others. There's an old story about the guest preacher at a church one Sunday morning. Standing at the door after worship, people came by and said the usual polite things about the service. But then one man approached who was acting a little odd. When he got to the minister, he just unloaded. That was the worst sermon I've ever heard. What kind of preacher do you think you are? That was terrible. And then he stormed out. The minister looked a little stunned. And then the next couple stepped up quickly to offer comfort. Oh, please, don't worry about that, they said. He didn't mean to say it. He just repeats whatever he hears from anyone else. Now, you all have been exceptionally kind to my colleagues and me about our preaching, and I assure you I've never heard anything quite like that at the door. But after my sermon last week, 
I had an unusual number of comments from people telling me that they really appreciated what I had to say. And so all week I've been pondering what it was that struck such a nerve. If you were with us last Sunday, you remember how I talked about how we are suffering from an epidemic of anger and an epidemic of loneliness. I've been turning that over in my mind this week, anger and loneliness, and it seems to me that they're both about being connected. After 14 months of lockdown, we are craving relationships and connections with other human beings. When I cross paths with someone I know in the aisle of the grocery store, it's like finding a long lost sibling. Social media posts share everything from silly cartoons to personal ponderings, inviting someone else to respond and relate. A few weeks ago on Youth Sunday, Rachel and I didn't quite know what to do with ourselves before worship, so we went and stood outside the narthex doors and greeted people as they arrived. I can't describe the looks we got except to say that people were thirsty for relationship. We are hardwired for connection and we are thirsty for it. Now to say that anger is about connection sounds counterintuitive, but it makes sense. I was a teenage daughter once, and I fought all the time with my mom because we were both trying to redefine our roles and stay in relationship. I tell couples in premarital counseling that I'm a whole lot less worried when they fight than, it, than when they stop fighting. When they stop fighting, that means the marriage is no longer worth the effort. I think connectedness is where Jesus is going with these words from John 15. Remember, this is the last night of his life on this earth. And so he has carefully chosen what he wants his disciples to remember. I am the vine, you are the branches, he says. You biblical scholars know this as one of seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am reflecting the name of God in the Hebrew scriptures. Remember when Moses meets God at the burning bush and asks what he should say if the Hebrews ask God's name, God says, tell them I am has sent you. I am Yahweh in Hebrew. I am who I am. And so here in the Gospel of John, Jesus claims that same authority. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now this final one. I am the vine. And you are the branches. Dale Bruner, a New Testament theologian, says that since most of us don't live in Napa Valley, the wine metaphor, the vine metaphor may not work as well. So he puts it this way. I, I am the root of the matter, and my father is the arborist. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. I am the vine, and you, and that's a plural you, so y'all, I am the vine and y'all are the branches. This is not a me and Jesus passage. This is about all of us and how we need one another. Interestingly, this is one of only two parables that appear in the entire Gospel of John. There are lots of parables in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John has only two. The other one we heard last week. Jesus says he has other sheep who are not of this fold, but that he will bring them also and that there will be one flock and one shepherd. So not only do we have no say in whose lives we are tangled up with, we don't even get to pick who is allowed into the sheepfold and who gets the boot. All of those decisions, it turns out, are handed over to the vine grower or the shepherd. 
This morning in our service in the sanctuary, we will be introducing the newest members of our congregation, the confirmation class that started in the fall of 2019 and had to put everything on hold over the last year. They met with the session last month to read faith statements they had prepared. And if one thing came through loud and clear in those statements, it was this. These young people know that they are loved. They know that they are loved and welcomed at New Providence, but more importantly, they know that they are loved and welcomed by God. It's been said that you can be feared or you can be loved, but you cannot be both. As far as I'm concerned, the great gift of this confirmation process is that our young people are not afraid of God. They love God and they know they are loved by God, but they are not afraid of God. And that thanks goes to all of you. And thanks to the work of the arborist, their lives and our lives are all intertwined together. We are branches of the same vine, all of us nurtured in the rich soil of love. And by God's grace, may that love bear fruit through us. Amen. Would you please join me now for a time of prayer? Let us pray. Holy God, we give to you all glory and honor. You have loved us beyond measure and made us capable of loving you and ourselves and our neighbors. We come to you now in prayer that we may lay our burdens and our fears before you and that you may grant us respite. Lord, you remind us this week that you are the source of all growth. Your creation surrounds us with flowers and bloom and forest and fields thickened with new life. Yet we know that there are many around the world who do not feel the joy of its abundance. There are many who go to beds hungry and thirsty, who shiver in the night with no walls or roofs to protect them from the elements. So many do not have what they need, and too few have much more than they will ever need. We pray that your abundance may not stay stagnant in the hands of those with access, that we may trust in faith more than we seek security in filling our own stores. Lord, you tell us that you will remove all branches in us that bear no fruit. Too long has hatred and violence and racism and privilege withered your works in our hearts and our communities. Heal the people and places this rot has impacted. Free the tormented and oppressed, and do not allow our sins to harden their hearts. Do not let us continue to water that which you have tried to prune out. O oh Lord, we ask that you abide in your people, especially those dealing with sickness and death, those who are facing trials, those who seek a way forward where there appears to be no way. Bring us to those who you wish us to love, and bring those to us who need most to be loved. All of this we ask in the name of the one who taught us to love without reservation our Lord Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We hear in scripture that the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. No one person, no one offering, no singular gift that we may offer will bear fruit on its own. 
when we offer our time and talent and resources, we recognize that it is God who gives the growth, God who binds it all together, and God that allows it to bear fruit. So let us bring forth our gifts to God this morning, knowing that through God, all things are possible. Join us in singing, Though I May Speak. Though I may speak with bravest fire And have the gift to all inspire And have not love my words are vain As sounding brass and hopeless gain Though I may give all I possess, and striving so my love profess, but not begin my love within, the prophet soon turns strangely thin. Come, Spirit, come, our hearts control, our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed, by this we worship and are free. Go now and love one another, because love is from God. Remain in Christ Jesus, and like branches on a vine, draw your life from him. And may God, the vine grower, tend you and make your life fruitful. May Christ abide in you and give you life. And may the Holy Spirit cast out all fear and fill you with love. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.